Here's how to really cash in on this year. Get serious. Life is serious. We're here to instruct. We're here to grow. We're here to learn. We're here to get the best we possibly can. Serious. Life is serious. The future is serious. How come such a difference from those who can reach such incredible heights and those who haven't yet found the answers for their life and their health and their future? We just have to ponder that and let that give us a note of seriousness, a note of seriousness. It's serious whether you win or lose. It's serious whether you succeed or fail. It's serious whether you've got a good future carved out for yourself or you do not have. And I'm asking you to take it serious. Take your own future serious. What you can do for your family, take it serious. This is serious business. So that's the first thing I want to bring to you. To have the best year ever this year, get serious. You know, study, learn, grow, change, develop. Never let it be said you didn't learn, right? If you want to solve your problems, you got to learn. If you want to take advantage of an opportunity, you got to learn. We can't come here and just give you the marketing plan, give you the product, send you home. We got to stay for a while. Learn, stay for a while. Put on those cassettes and stay for a while. Learn from your own experience, right? So the call didn't go well, all the stuff. Guess what they did when they finished that call? They made another call. What else could we do to make it better? How could we possibly improve? This is called the possibility for life change starts with education. Don't be lazy in learning. Don't be lazy in picking up the ideas. Don't be lazy in learning from your own experience. That's why you've heard from some people that have shared their testimonial here and given you some of their ideas, ways, and means. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of life change. Do some learning. Take it back home. To have your best year ever, make your dreams come true, and get smart. A few simple disciplines practiced every day, and you've started a whole new process called a whole new life. And if you keep up that process, not only with your health habits, but with your money habits, and with your communication habits, with your sales habits, and management habits, and every other habit that you've got, if you'll start that process, eliminate the errors and replace it with disciplines practiced I'm telling you, you can start this process of life change immediately. After today, you don't ever have to be the same again. Only by choice. Errors in judgment, disaster. A few simple disciplines, wealth beyond imagination. Let the miracle of everything that's available work for you and start working on the inside. Work on your philosophy, work on your attitude, work on your personality, work on your language, work on the gift of communication, work on all of your abilities. And if you'll start making those personal changes, I'm telling you, everything will change for you. Work on yourself, then you bring more value to the partnership, to the marriage, to the franchise, to the corporation, to the enterprise, to the community, to the nation. Self-development, personal development. The best contribution you can make to someone else is self-development. Not hasty if it isn't required, but don't lose much time. Here's the time to act. When the idea is hot and the emotion is strong, that's the time to act. Don't use the excuses they use. It's called the language of the poor. Switch gears, switch language, switch ideas, switch strategy. Start with the simplest of disciplines. And don't be mean any of these disciplines. The smallest of disciplines starts the process of life change. And if you'll invest in this thing called discipline, you can have whatever you wish. It's called the beginning of a miracle. If you will get better, everything will get better for you. What a clear message that was for me. He said, if you'll change your philosophy, you'll change your habits, if you'll refine your thinking, if you'll change and accept some new disciplines, if you'll turn the corner where you've been in the past, go for a new life for the future, he said all kinds of remarkable things will happen for you if you will change. Here's what we must learn to do. I didn't go to work to try to change circumstances. I went to work to try to change myself. And I picked up that promise my teacher shared with me that if I would change, my income would change. If I would change, my bank account would change. If I would change, my future would change. And sure enough, his promise came true for me. You know, the companies were about the same. What they paid was the same. Circumstances around me were the same. You know, my negative relatives were the same, but I was not the same. That's how my life changed. Things started working for me, changing my life all those years ago. We don't have to change what's going on out there. That's the wind that's blowing. All we have to do is change what's going on in here. And now there's several ways to do that. The first subject he called personal development. 
We must learn from personal experience. Pretty simple. Learn from what happens to you. Take a look back over the last few months. Did you make some mistakes? How could you correct those for the future? Take a look back over the last year. Have you done it right or done it wrong? Let's correct it for the next year. Mr. Shof asked me when I first met him, he said, Mr. Owen, how are you doing? You've been out there now six years. And I said, I'm not doing very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. What a simple, swift analysis to my situation. He said, if you keep doing it, the next six years will be like the last six. You don't want that to happen. Let's make the changes. So learn from your personal experience. Second, other people's experiences. That's me, other people. That's your teacher. That's your friends and colleagues, the people you meet that can pass along to you their experiences, what's happened to them, the mistakes they made, how they corrected them, how they changed their health and changed their bank account and changed their income and changed their future. Other people. Now, there's two kinds of people to learn from. One is failures. It's too bad failures don't give seminars, right? That would be valuable. Have them tell you how they lost it all and threw it all away, threw their health away and threw their friendships away and things didn't work out well. That would be valuable. But now then we must also learn from positive people that have done well. They've got the health. And so we ask them, how did you become so healthy? They've got the skills. So we ask them, how did you become this skillful? They've got the income. So we ask them, how did you get here in such a short period of time? So now here's what's important in personal development. In learning from other people, we learn, number one, by observation. We learn what we see. We watch people that are successful in what they do. In sports, we watch their disciplines. In business, we watch their disciplines. Second, we learn by what we hear. Learn by listening. And then listen to the sermon on Sunday morning. Listen to the lectures. Listen to the teacher. Listen to someone who's got something good to say. And then number three is vitally important on personal development, and that is read all the books, all the books you can possibly read in your lifetime. Mr. Shof got me started on my library. I've got one of the better libraries. And then I started keeping a journal. One of the major things my teacher taught me was to keep a journal. He said, don't trust your memory. If you hear something good, just make a little note and write it down. So I would suggest you do the same. Things that impress you, a poem that impresses you. Uh, when you attend a class, some of the ideas that impressed you, jot them down. You read something in a magazine, right? Some ideas, take those out, put them in your journal. Keep a good journal the rest of your life. This will serve you well. So I want the same thing to happen to you. Value captured that you can resort to later. Go back over it and review it and let it become valuable to you. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Develop the skills, learn the lessons, take the classes, uh, absorb all that is being taught to you these days. And then later on, of course, you can sort it out, what's valuable to you and how to refine it for your business and for your life and for your future. But the main thing is to get it and start this process of personal change. Now let's cover the second step, setting goals. We need to take a look into the future. There are four things to consider in terms of attitude. One is how you feel about the past. Best advice I can give you on that is treat the past as a school. Let it teach you the mistakes you've made, the things that went wrong, the things that didn't work. Don't use the past as a burden to carry and don't use the past as a club to beat yourself to death. Past losses, past failures, past mistakes. But let the past be a school. Tough school maybe, we've all been through some tough stuff. So if you feel good about the past, draw from it for experience and let it teach you. Then next is how you feel about the future. We've got to have the future well designed. The future is called the promise. The promise of the future can be an awesome force. Designing the future, there's two ways to face the future. One is with apprehension and the other is with anticipation. I promise you in my travels around the world, most people face the future with apprehension. And here's why, they don't have it well designed. They've sort of left that up to someone else to fix. But here's the best way to face the future with anticipation. You can face the future with anticipation if the future is clear, if the future is well designed. In setting goals, it's very simple. Number one, decide what you want. You just take a little time. You sit down and say, what do I want? 
What kind of skills do I want? What kind of income do I want for the future? Where would I like to go? Places I'd like to visit? Habits I'd like to acquire? Skills I'd like to have? Economics? Friendships? People you'd like to meet? When you've thought about what you want for the future, make a list. If the future gets clear, the price gets easier. Because you got to remember, for every promise, there's a price to pay. Everybody's got to pay the price. Everybody's got to do the deal. Everybody's got to do the disciplines. But here's what I've discovered. If the promise is clear and powerful, the price is easy to pay. The price is some classes. The price is a few books. The price is a few disciplines. The price is finding something that'll make your life better, make you grow, make you change, make you develop. So the first part of the key is to design the promise. Then what is the price to pay? I'm telling you, the price will be easy. If you'll make the promise of the future clear for yourself, all of the values of life that you could possibly want and be serious about it. I promise you it's an easy price to pay Anybody can pay it. And the best advice I can give you is if I can do it, you can do it. Start setting your goals and see if you can't get a better excitement going for the things you want to accomplish for the future. One of the major reasons for setting goals is for what they make of you in achieving them. My teacher advised me when I first got started at age 25, he said, Jim, why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? I'm here to help you. And he said, here's why, for what it will make of you to achieve it. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve them. So part of the key here is to set the kind of goals that will make something of you. Don't set them too low so that you don't have to grow and you don't have to read and you don't have to try and you don't have to stretch. Don't set them too low. And then don't sell out don't go for something that's going to cost you your virtue or cost you your values or sell out your principles. There's a good middle road here to follow. Goals that will inspire, goals that will help you grow, change, develop, and become better than you are. So if you want something to pull you through all kinds of challenges, all kinds of difficulties, and things that come at you, you got to have something on out there, beyond today, beyond next week, beyond next month beyond this year that pulls you into the future. And the clearer it is, the stronger it pulls. The more dynamic it is, the more it affects your life, your spirit, your heart, your soul. It also creates imagination. It gets your mind working on how to achieve that purpose. And if your mind will work, and if your heart works, and if your spirit works, and if you have good input, like good ideas, I'm telling you, there isn't anything you can't accomplish. Ideas gather dust, you know, they don't produce at all by themselves. It's like philosophy is not the end, philosophy is the beginning. Philosophy must be invested. When I talked about philosophy, attitude, and disciplines, they must be invested. And if you invest philosophy and attitude in disciplines, then they produce results. Here's a good phrase, wisdom uninvested in labor is wasted. Attitude, even the highest of attitude, which is faith. Faith uninvested is wasted, produces nothing. So the name of the game is not faith. The name of the game is not philosophy. The name of the game is to put faith and philosophy into activity so that it starts making progress. Turning nothing into something. Let me give you that formula while I'm on it here. Turning nothing into something. How do you do that? How do you turn nothing into something? Here's how you start. There's three steps to it. Number one, imagination. And try to imagine yourself in those new, worthwhile, unique positions. So imagination starts to change everything. Now imagination is not tangible, but it is almost real almost real. It's not real, but it's almost real. But it's hard to say that imagination is nothing, but it's nothing in terms of tangible. It's not, it's not tangible yet. And you always have to say yet. Imagination is not tangible yet, but it is the beginning of turning nothing into something. 
It's the beginning of turning nothing into reality, imagination. Imagination is the ability to see things that don't yet exist. Imagination is real in the sense that it affects. It'll affect your behavior, it'll affect your enthusiasm, it'll affect your emotions. It's real in that sense, but it's not real in the tangible sense. Next is faith. To believe that what you imagine is possible. How would we start to strengthen our belief in that what we imagine is possible to turn it into reality? And there's two or three ways. One is to believe your own testimony. If you've done it before, why couldn't you do it again? If you've done it once, couldn't you do it the second time? Why not believe in your own testimonial? If I did it before, I can do it again. And that's what's important about personal development. You can lose the money, but not the skill. So who cares about the money? It's like sales. A skill is more valuable than a sale. Someone, sometimes a salesperson says, I need a sale. I said, no, you need a skill. Sales are temporary. Skills are permanent. Now we move to faith to believe that what we imagine is possible. So we study our own testimony. If we've done it before, we can do it again. Here's what else we study. Other testimonials of somebody who did it. Somebody that built a hotel said, yes, I started with some plans and finally believed it was possible, and here it is. Say, well, if it's possible for one, it's possible for another. In fact, sometimes when we hear the testimonial, here's how they finished. If I can do it, okay. you can do it. See, that that's a classic testimonial that gives us now what we call faith. And, and one of the ancient wise writers said, faith is generated by what we hear the vocabulary of what we hear, the vocabulary of what we read, that generates faith to believe that it's possible. Now, faith is not reality. You can't say faith is nothing because it affects. It's like radiation. To us, it's nothing because it can't be seen. Right? You can't see it, but it has an incredible effect. And that's true of faith. Faith can't be seen, right, with the natural eye can't be seen, but it has an incredible effect on your attitude, on your behavior, on your disciplines, on your work for the day, and all the rest. Here's what one writer described faith. Faith is a substance, a substance of hope. Now, it's, it's, it's not a substance like a brick being a piece of the hotel, but it's almost. It's so close, it's substance. And it the writer also said it's so close, it's evidence. Now, not evidence you can see, but tangible evidence that's just as real as all of our human experiences that can't be touched, can't be seen. It's called the unseen magic. Language is the unseen magic. It can't be seen. The words can't be seen as they're transmitted from the speaker to the one who listens, but it can have a profound effect. That means it's more than nothing. Language is more than nothing. But to create something out of nothing, we start with imagination. Then we move to faith, which believes it's possible, which is almost real. But now here's what we do with faith and imagination. We deposit it in disciplines and activity. Because faith without the activity serves no useful purpose. Imagination without the activity to translate it into reality serves no purpose. But wisdom and faith deposited in activity creates reality. The reality of a career, the reality of a hotel that wasn't there. Now here's all you got to do is to turn that around. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. A few simple disciplines practiced every day starts to create success. Not at the end of the first day. The first day is the end of a new beginning. Every new discipline affects the rest. Every new discipline makes a difference. That's why action is so important. The smallest action, the least action, the action that you won't think will matter. It all matters. Take it. Because when you start accomplishing and the value starts to return, you'll find inspiration to do the next one and the next one and the next one. 
But for this whole process to work for us, we must first master the art of discipline, self-discipline, consistent self-discipline. It doesn't really matter how smart you are or how much you know if you don't use it. It doesn't really matter that you graduated magna cum laude if you're stuck in a low-paying job. It doesn't really matter if you attended every seminar that comes to town if you don't apply what you've learned. Better than knowledge is applied knowledge. And once we've applied our knowledge, we must study the results of that process. Apply our knowledge, study the results. Refine our approach. Finally, by trying and observing and refining and trying again, our knowledge will inevitably produce worthy results, admirable results. And with the joy and results of our efforts, we continue to apply, to learn, to observe, to fuel our ambition with the positive reinforcement of continued progress. Pretty soon, we'll find that we're swept into a spiral of achievement, a vertical rise to success. It takes consistent self-discipline to master the art of setting goals, to master the art of time management, to master the art of leadership to master the art of parenting and relationships. If we don't make consistent self-discipline part of our daily lives, the results we seek will be sporadic and elusive. It takes a consistent effort to truly manage our valuable time, or we'll be consistently frustrated. Our time will be eaten up by others whose demands are stronger than our own. It takes discipline to conquer the nagging voices in our minds, the fear of failure, the fear of success, the fear of poverty, the fear of a broken heart. It takes discipline to keep trying when that nagging voice within us brings up the possibility of failure. It takes discipline to admit our errors and recognize our limitations. The voice of the human ego speaks to all of us. Sometimes the voice of ego says that we should magnify our value beyond our results. It leads us to exaggerate, to not be totally honest. It takes discipline to be totally honest, both with ourselves and with others. It takes discipline to change a habit, because habits are formed a little bit each day, every day, every day. Once habits are formed, they act like a giant cable. They act like a nearly unbreakable instinct that only long-term disciplined activity can change. You just got to go home and make a list after today. And here's the question to ask as you make this personal list. What am I not doing that would be easy to do? That could greatly change my health, my wealth. What am I not doing I'm neglecting that would be easy to do? Just go home and answer that question personally. You don't have to put the answers on a public bulletin board. This is just all personal stuff. But here's how you get a miracle going for your life. Number one, do what you can. Get a list of the stuff you could do and you haven't done, postpone, and start cleaning that up. You can't start at a better place for personal change. It'll affect your bank account, affect your future, affect your income, affect everything. You can't start a better life change process than cleaning up what you should be doing. The man says, well, my mother lives down in Florida. Should have written her six months ago. I just can't seem to get that letter written. I'm asking you to get that letter written, clean that up, and don't walk like other people walk. Don't postpone like other people postpone. You say, well, is it as simple as writing a letter? And the answer is yes. Where else would you start for life change, personal change? Now, here's the second part of the miracle. Number one is do what you can. Here's number two, do the best you can. If that's not your philosophy, I would ask you to amend it. Let me give you the best of ancient script. Here's what it says. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might, do it with all your strength, and do it with all your power. What a good philosophy. That kind of philosophy revolutionize your life if you haven't picked it up late. Guy slips in late, company doesn't seem to mind, slips out early, first one in the parking lot, heading for happy hour. Stretches his break, comes early for lunch, late back from lunch, company doesn't seem to notice, guy says, best as I can calculate, I'm putting in about a half a day's work and I'm collecting a full day's pay.
Little does he know the seeds of his own disaster are already being sown by the weakness of his own personal philosophy. It's not the economy that's going to determine your next six years. It's your philosophy about labor and about activity and about miracle and soil and seed and sunshine and rain and the economy and the banks and the money and the companies and the schools and what's going on. It's your philosophy and your attitude and then your ability to take action. All of that we call the process of life change, miracle working. Consistent self-discipline. Set up a discipline when the emotions are high and the idea is strong and clear and powerful. That's the time to set up the discipline. Somebody talks about good health and you're stirred. I said, right, I need to get a book on nutrition. Get the book before the idea passes and before the emotion gets cold. Go for the book, start the library, start the process, fall on the floor, do some push-ups. Action, gotta take action. Otherwise, the wisdom is wasted. Otherwise, the emotion soon passes. Unless you put it into a disciplined activity, capture it. Disciplines is called how to capture the emotion and how to capture the wisdom and translate it into equity. Disciplines. You start walking around the block, it'll inspire you to get an apple. Get an apple, it'll inspire you to get a book. Get a book, it'll inspire you to get a journal. Get a journal, it'll inspire you to grow, develop some skills. All disciplines affect each other. Every lack affects the rest. Every new affects the rest. The key is to diminish the lack and set up the new. And you've started a whole new life process. Also, one more thought on discipline. Here's the greatest value of discipline. Self-worth. Self-esteem. People are teaching self-esteem these days, but they don't connect it to disciplines. The least lack of discipline. And it starts to erode our psyche. One of the greatest temptations is to just ease up a little bit, right? The, the, the slightest lack of doing your best starts to erode the psyche. Instead of doing your best, doing just a little less than your best. Sure enough, you say, well, it's just going to affect my sales. No, it's going to affect your consciousness. It's going to affect your philosophy. Now you've begun in the slightest way to affect your own philosophy. Here's the problem with the least neglect. Neglect starts as an infection. And if you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. And one neglect leads to another. And the worst of all, when neglect starts, it diminishes our self-worth, our self-confidence, our self-value. You say, well, how can I get back my self-respect? I'm telling you, you don't have to go to 29 classes. All you have to do is start the smallest discipline that now corresponds to your own philosophy, like I should, and I could, and I will. No longer will I let neglect stack up on me so that I will have the sorry scenario six years from now, giving some excuse instead of celebrating my progress. That's the key to discipline, okay? Let's get kids involved in the least of disciplines. One more, and then one more, and then another one, and then another one, and then some more. And the first thing you know, you're starting to weave the tapestry of a disciplined life into which you can pour more wisdom and more attitude and more strong feeling, more faith and more courage. Now you've got something, a vessel in which to put it. And now the equities start to flow. And the early return, I'm telling you, if you'll start this process, the early return will have you so excited. You'll commit yourself to this strategy for the rest of your life. You'll never go back to the old ways. Join a new crowd, join a new group. The discipline's to do it, take action. Now here's the other side of discipline. If there's considerable time that passes between the moment of awareness and the time of our implementation, then that is called procrastination. Procrastination, doing it tomorrow instead of today. Procrastination, an almost exact opposite of discipline. The voice within us says, get it done. Discipline then says, do it now. Do it to the best of your ability, today, tomorrow, and always, until finally the worthy deed becomes instinctive. Procrastination says, later, tomorrow, whenever I get a chance. Procrastination also says, do what is necessary to get by or to impress others. Do what you can, but not what you must. 
In every circumstance we face, we are constantly presented with these two choices. Do it now or do it later. Discipline and procrastination. A choice between a disciplined existence bearing the fruit of achievement and contentment or procrastination. The easy life for which the future will bear no fruit. Only the bare branches of mediocrity. The rewards of a disciplined life are great but they're often delayed until some time in the future. The rewards for the lack of discipline are immediate, but they are minor in comparison to the immeasurable rewards of consistent self-discipline. An immediate reward for lack of discipline is a fun day at the beach. A future reward of discipline is owning the beach. For most, we choose today's pleasure rather than tomorrow's fortune. So how can you get rid of the easy distractions? How can you keep your mind on what you're trying to do? How can you keep an attitude of doing it all and doing it now? How can you make the choice of discipline over procrastination? How can you stay focused on your ambitions? How can you avoid conversations at the water cooler? You can keep your focus on your work. You can get it done today instead of tomorrow. You've got to really work on your consistent self-discipline on a daily basis or you'll find yourself distracted. Distracted by negative thoughts, distracted by negative people, distracted by water cooler chatter, and pretty soon, depending on the type of people you've associated with, distracted by your doubts within yourself. Never underestimate the power of influence and associations and never underestimate the power of your own consistent self-discipline. Now let's take a closer look at discipline, at the three steps to becoming disciplined. First, true discipline is not the easiest option. Most people would rather sleep until 10 o'clock than get up at 6. It's easier to go to bed late, sleep late, show up late, leave early, it's easier not to read. It's easier to turn on the television than to open a book. It's easier to do just enough than to do it all. Waiting is always easier than acting. Trying is always easier than doing. Imagine what life would be like if we didn't have to make our bed in the morning or keep our garage clean or pay our taxes or show up for work tomorrow. Wouldn't it be fascinating if we didn't have to do these things, wouldn't it be fascinating? What do you suppose would become of us? You're right, not much. For whatever the reason, the system we live in and contribute to is designed to make the easiest things in life the most unprofitable. Profitable seems to be the most difficult. Our world is and always will be a constant battle between the life of ease and its momentary rewards and a life of discipline, and its far more significant rewards. Each has its own price, the price of discipline or the price of regret. The second lesson of discipline is that it's a full-time activity. And we've said that the best form of discipline is consistent self-discipline. You see, the discipline that it takes to make your bed every day is the same discipline necessary for success in the world of business. The discipline to organize your garage is the same discipline to organize your business. All disciplines carry through to affect all parts of our lives. If we're disciplined in just one area and lazy in another, guess what? Pretty soon the lazy side will creep in and destroy the discipline side. The bad habits in one area of our life will eventually destroy our self-discipline in the areas we've been working on. Consistency cannot be inconsistent. Discipline is the mind being trained to control our lives. Discipline is a set of standards which we've selected as a personal code of conduct. Discipline is imposing on ourselves the requirements for honoring these standards. Once we've adopted these standards of behavior and conduct, we're committed to honor them. And if we don't, then there can be no disciplined activity. Here's the third step to becoming consistently self-disciplined. 
Number one is realizing that discipline isn't the easiest option. Number two, discipline is a full-time activity, day by day, every day. And the third step to becoming self-disciplined is really a philosophy that holds one of life's unique promises. Number three simply says, for every disciplined effort, there is a multiple reward. That's one of life's great arrangements. Life is full of laws that both govern and explain behaviors. But this may well be the major law we need to understand. For every disciplined effort, a multiple reward. For every disciplined effort, a multiple reward. What a concept. If you render unique service, your reward will be multiplied. If you're fair and honest and patient with others, your reward will be multiplied. If you give more than you expect to receive, your reward is more than you expect. But remember, the key word here, as you might well imagine, is discipline. Everything of value requires care and attention. Everything of value requires discipline. Children require discipline. They must have a structure built for them. They must have boundaries to work within so they feel secure and comfortable to explore and grow. They must learn to recognize what's right and what's wrong, what's acceptable behavior, what's not acceptable. Children require unwavering discipline, consistent discipline, or they'll be confused as to how they're supposed to behave. The most valuable form of discipline is the one that you impose on yourself. Don't wait for things to deteriorate so drastically that someone else must impose discipline into your life. Wouldn't that be tragic? How could you possibly explain the fact that someone else thought more of you than you thought of yourself? That they forced you to get up early and get out into the marketplace when you would have been content to let success go to someone else who cared more about themselves. Your life, my life, the life of each one of us is going to serve as either a warning or an example. In the end, it is your own discipline that acts as the magic catalyst to give substance and depth to your ambition. To achieve your own plans and dreams, to have what you want to have, and to become what you want to become, your consistent self-discipline is the magic catalyst. Humans also need words. Words nourish the mind. Words give life. Words create insight. Because there's more than one way to see. If we see with our eyes, we call that sight. But there's another way to see called insight. That's why we come, gather for a couple of days, attend the classes, go to the training, read the books, do all the stuff, is to develop more insight. Letting our mind be nourished to think, ponder, and wonder, and conceive ideas, projects, purpose, give structure to something for the future, whether it's better health or better career, better future. Next, the mind needs to be exercised. And we talked a bit about that earlier, exercised by debate, exercised by reading both sides of the debate, both sides of the question major life issues, major political issues. Don't leave yourself out of the great debate. One, the mind needs to be nourished by ideas. Second, it needs to be refined and stimulated and exercised by debate. We need both sides of the human drama represented. The reason why the Bible is such a classic book in studying all kinds of stories is because the Bible is full of stories on both sides, the evil side and the good side. The Bible said, Old Testament said, this king came to power and he was a good king. He ruled for 18 years. And then it says the next king came to power and he was a bad king and he put up idols. He became the bad king. So the, it reads good king, bad king, showing both sides of the human spectrum and drama. Some stories that we read in the Bible of people to admire, others are people to despise. In your library, you need a book on Gandhi and you need a book on Hitler. 
one book to show you how noble someone's aspirations can be, and the other book to show you how despicable and how evil someone's goals can be. Both sides we study good and evil, one we love and one we hate. We study illness, we study health. Someone says, well, you can't study the negative things. You have to study the negative things. You have to give voice to and mind to and time to both sides of the issue so that you can strengthen your side of the argument. Then our personal philosophy needs to be developed so we can see the opportunities on the other side so we can maximize those. And for the balance of your life, that's going to be the twin challenge in developing ideas and philosophy and strengthening all of it so that you can avoid the dangers, maximize the opportunities. Because the dangers never go away. The dangers to our ship of state called the country. The danger to the enterprise, the danger to the corporation. Dangers always lurk, both inside and out. Dangers lurk on the inside of our own mind. The battle of the mind is significant for us every day. What to think, what not to think. My mentor, Mr. Shove, said, stand guard at the door of your mind. And you decide what enters. You decide what to fill up your mind with because it becomes the material with which you build your future. So engaging the mind to make rational decisions about life. Beware of the thief on the street that's after your purse, but also beware of the thief in your mind that's after your promise. The thief in your mind that says, you're too short, you're too tall, you've never done it before. What makes you think you can do it now? It's not gonna work for you. Someone else could find the book, you'll never find the book. If you found the book, you wouldn't read it. If you did read it, you wouldn't understand it. That's stuff that goes on in our mind. So jot down this key phrase, it's one of the best for the day. Whatever you do, don't become a victim of yourself. As you engage in this debate, what to eat, what not to eat, where to go, where not to go, what to say, what not to say, what to do, what not to do. Make sure that you strengthen the positive side of this argument with yourself so that day by day you become healthier, day by day you become stronger, day by day you become wiser, day by day you build a better shield and immunity, an inside immunity to ward off disease, but an outside immunity to ward off all the negative and all the trash and all the stuff that would not enhance your personal development nor your promise for the future. So this is so important in understanding the mind. Feed it. We call it food for thought. That's what a big share of this whole seminar is all about these three days, is to writing food to think about, thoughts to think about, and then ideas to debate. And it's not necessarily what's right or what's wrong, but what's better, what's best. This is okay, but this would be better. With this, yes, you can manage, but with this, you can flourish. With this, you can exist. With this, you can live a fantastic life. So, exercising the mind. Now, to develop the mind, you need a good library. Let me give you three parts to your library. Number one is your visual library. Zig and I and others have put things on video so you can see it. We ask you to come here today and see what's going on. So part of it comes by visual, come and see. And then if it's on video, you can see it again and again and again. Key phrase, repetition is the mother of learning. Repetition is where if we hear it again, we see something we didn't see when we heard it the first time. We see something different that we didn't see the first time. Next is your listening library. Zig Ziglar's right, turn your car into a mobile classroom. You can have a university education in a fairly short period of time just using the traveling time to listen. Key phrase is to listen to voices of value. Discriminate in your listening time. Listening to someone of reputation, someone who has good ideas, someone that's been recommended that has some value. Don't waste your time listening to things that don't count much. Hey, there's some things that are not worth spending the time. You know, they create more poison than they do benefit. So be careful. If somebody says to me, these eggs are rotten, I'm not gonna make an omelet and try it. I'm gonna take their word for it. 
So feed the mind, exercise the mind, and build your library. Make this note, you cannot live on mental candy. Just like you can't feed your children ice cream all the time and hope that they will be healthy. So you cannot live on mental candy. Someone says, well, I just read the positive stuff. That's not enough. And the reason is because you need to know both sides of the issue. So start your library like I did, age 25. I mentioned in another seminar, haven't read everything in my library, but I feel smarter just walking in it, right? And smart enough to buy it. Now I gotta be smart enough to read it all. Then I gotta be smart enough to sort through and decide what's valuable. So make that the next part now. In part of personal development for the mind, you gotta sort through what you read, what you see and what you hear and decide which of all of that is valuable for you to try and do and master. This is where being a student comes in, not a follower, but a student. You read one book on good health and it says, do what this book says, you'll live forever. You read the next book on health and nutrition and it says, if you do what that first book says, you'll die young. So someone says to me, Mr. Owen, which of these books should I follow? Jot this down, neither one. Don't be a follower, read both books and make up your own mind. Here's what's important in the final analysis. One of the best phrases for the day, I make sure what you finally do is the product of your own conclusion. Make sure what you finally do is the product of your own conclusion. Meaning you don't just follow, but you listen to both sides of the argument. You listen to the controversy. You try to master the points on both sides or three sides or whatever. Then you start charting your own course. It doesn't make you, doesn't say you'll make always the right decision on what course to take or what to do. You can refine as you go, but make sure that what you do is the product of your own conclusions, conclusions from the debate, conclusion from what makes the best sense to you to try. Now, jot this down. Also give yourself a chance to change. Some things I held on to that I thought this was it, this was it. I'm telling you, after a while I gave it up, found out it wasn't it. So give yourself a chance to change. Refine your philosophy. Refine your direction. If you'll give yourself a chance to do that, here's what will happen down the road a ways. A new door will open that you haven't discovered before. Give yourself a chance to change. Reevaluate. So let your library be a testimonial of your dedicated interest in accelerated personal development, that you will read whatever you have to read. You will hear whatever you must hear, and you will watch and see whatever you must see in order to make your life refined and worthwhile and achieve all of your purposes. It takes a lot of effort to learn. It takes a lot of effort to grow. It takes a lot of effort to decide and debate. But jot this down, it's all worth the price. Now, it's also very important intellectually to know whether or not you're headed this way or this way. And once you decide, 10 years from now, I think that the gathering of my intellectual and personal and spiritual and moral and economic treasure may not be that great. The key is to start right now making these changes to walk this new road. But here's what's exciting to me, just a few daily disciplines makes a great deal of difference in one year, three years, five years, just a few daily disciplines. And that's what I'd like to talk about in this series, just these few daily disciplines that make the difference, whether you wind up here or here. Good question. 10 years from now, you will surely arrive. The question is, where? We don't want to kid ourselves about where. We don't want to kid ourselves about the road we're walking. I had a day shortly after I met Mr. Schof called, do not kid myself anymore day. I don't want to go disillusioned anymore. You know, I was using the cross finger theory back when I was 25, 24, 23. I finally decided that the cross finger theory was not going to get me what I wanted. That isn't where the treasure lies. That I'm going to have to make sure which of these ways I'm headed. But a few reading disciplines and a few disciplines of mind and a few disciplines of activity, and you can make all the difference in the world whether you wind up here or whether you wind up here. But just a few changes. 
Sometimes we get the idea that we're doing about 10% and there's about 90% more that we need in order to make the difference for our fortune. And probably the opposite is true, right? We're doing enough things to have arrived here today. We're doing enough things to have bought and shared in the good life so far. And maybe all you need is that extra 5%, 10% of intellectual change, activity change, a refinement of discipline, a refinement of thought. And all we need is the ideas to make those simple changes. And the equity starts gathering in one year, three years, five years, 10 years. I have a good comment for your notes. Now's the time to fix the next 10 years. Now's the time to fix it. Now, sometimes you have to come to grips with reality and with truth. That's what was good for me when I met Mr. Schoff. I was 25 years old, he was 44 years old. And he brought me a wealth of experience and he started asking me the tough questions. Big question, he said, are you reading the books that's gonna take you where you want to go in the next five years? Excellent question. So you wanna make sure. I would assume for all of you to get where you wanna be in the next five years, you're either reading the right books or you're not. That's kind of a brilliant statement, right? You're either engaged in the disciplines or you're not. But here's what we don't wanna engage in disillusion, right? Hoping without acting, you know, wishing without doing. So the key is to take a look and say, where am I? What could I do to make the changes, to make sure that I can take more certain daily steps toward the treasure I want, the mental treasure, the personal treasure, the spiritual treasure, the financial treasure. I don't want to make any errors. Now's the time to adjust my daily program to take me where I want to go. A good note for you to take. We could all use a little coaching. When you're playing the game, it's sometimes hard to see it all. And if you just take a breather, take a little time out. It's what we're doing here in this lecture series. Take a little time out, listen to someone's experiences, which is what I want to share with you, my experiences, my ideas, and see if it might cause for you a little moment of correction so that you can make some changes that'll add up to some extra worth in the next one year, three years, five years. So, ideas, I hope you'll find here during this series. All kinds of ideas, health ideas, enterprise ideas, living the better life ideas, and primarily for this series, skills of leadership, ideas. The next key word is inspiration. Inspiration is a mystery, why some people are inspired and some are not. Who knows what that mystery is? Some people have this incredible zest for life and an appetite for living well and doing well, and others seem to take the ho-hum attitude, let it slide, and hopefully it'll work out anyway. I don't know what the difference of that is, but it is exciting to watch people who are inspired but I think the key to it all is self-motivation. Self-motivation. The guy says, boy, if somebody just come by and turn me on, hey, what if they don't show up? You got to have a better plan for your life. Personal inspiration, drawing emotional vitality from life and the challenge, going for it. We all admire that. I think my personal advice to you would be, and reach down inside of you and come up with some more of those remarkable human gifts. They're there, waiting to be utilized. And then change anything for you you want to change. And I challenge you to do that because you can change. Let other people lead small lives, but not you. Let everybody else cry over small hurts, but not you. Let everybody else argue over non-essentials, but not you. Deal in things that matter. Make sure what you do is the product of your own conclusion. Don't just learn how to earn, learn how to live. And that's what lifestyle is all about, learning how to live. Here's one of the great challenges of life, being happy with what you have while in pursuit of what you want. So develop your lifestyle a little more, your style of seeing, giving, sharing, enjoying. It's not the amount that counts, but the experience of choosing to live with style. I remember saying to Mr. Schof one time, if I had more money, I would be happy. And he gave me some of the better words of wisdom when he said to me, Mr. Rohn, the key to happiness is not more. Happiness is an art to be studied in practice. He said, more money will only make you more of what you already are. More will only more quickly send you on to your destination. He said, if you're inclined to be unhappy, if you get a lot of money, you will be miserable. More money will only make you more. More money will only amplify. If you're inclined to be mean and you get a lot of money, you will be a terror. 
if you're inclined to drink a little too much, when you get a lot of money, you can now become a drunk. So style is not more. Style is an art, a genius, a design. Lifestyle is reserved for those who are willing to study and practice the higher arts of life. Lifestyle is culture, music, dance, art, sculpture, literature, plays, concerts. Lifestyle is a taste of the fine, the better, the best. Mortimer Adler, the philosopher says, if we don't go for the higher tastes, we will settle for the lower ones. So develop an appreciation for the fine. That is a worthy purpose. Developing an appetite for the unique things in life. Study the art and reach for the best. To have the best in the time we have available to us, that is the quest. Remember, it's not the amount, it's the imagination. Be somebody. That's a good challenge. Be somebody. Be somebody wise. Be somebody strong. Strength is attractive. Be somebody kind. Now consider this. Some people have plenty of beautiful things filling their days, but they get little happiness from them. Some people have money, but they have trouble finding joy in their lives. Imagine a father wads up a $5 bill and throws it at his son saying, here, if you need the darn stuff that bad, take it. Same money, poor style. And remember, it's not the amount that counts. It's the style that counts. Mr. Shove taught me lifestyle in those early days, starting with small amounts. He said, imagine that you're getting your shoes shined and the shoe shine boy has done a fabulous job. You have one of the world's all time great shines. So you pay him for the shine. Now you consider from the change in your hand, what kind of tip to give him. And the question pops into your mind, shall I give him one quarter or two quarters for my neat shine? Mr. Shelf said, if two amounts for a tip ever come to your mind, always go for the higher amount. He said, become a two quarter person. I said, what difference would that make? One quarter or two quarters? He said, all the difference in the world. If you said, well, I'll just give him one quarter. That will affect you for the rest of the day. You will start feeling bad. Sure enough, in the middle of the day, you will look down at your great shoe shine and say, I've got to be cheap. One lousy quarter. That will affect you. However, if you go for two quarters, Shof said you can't believe the feeling you can buy for another quarter. That's lifestyle becoming a two-quarter person and learning to get joy from the greater person you are becoming. Just two modest examples of how easy it is to put style in your life. Make sure you don't miss out. Don't miss anything you can enjoy. Be sure you live your life in style. Now let me give you a unique part of life. The pull is in the opposite direction and it always is. Here's what success is. Success is learning to move in the opposite direction of the normal negative pull. Success is just overcoming the normal negative downward trend. Because I guess that's what life was meant to be. Overcoming the normal negative downward pull. Success is moving in the opposite direction. Life that springs from the seed really is moving in the opposite direction. Gravity wants to pull the seed down, but sure enough, the seed being pulled down by the soil takes root, comes to life, right? Comes to life, takes root, starts to grow. And which way does it grow? Up, right? It gets the roots and the nourishment, but it grows up. It pushes its way against gravity. It moves up. And that's what success is. That's what life is of movement in the opposite direction. Here's something else to think about. Did you ever hear where the expression tip came from? As in tipping the waiter or waitress in a restaurant. Mr. Shove taught me that it began as a symbol for the phrase to ensure promptness. Now, Shove said, if a tip is to ensure promptness, when should you give it? Answer, up front. See, I didn't know that. I said, no, you have lunch, and if you get good service, you leave a good tip. If you get lousy service, no tip. And he said to me, no, no, Mr. Roan. 
Sophisticated people don't take a chance on good service. They ensure good service by giving the money up front. I said, wow, what a way to live. I had never thought of that. So the next time you have someone special to take to lunch, call the waitress over, arm around the shoulders and say, here's five dollars. Would you take good care of me and my friend? Shof said, you won't believe what happens. They do what's known as hover. They hover around your table. One last major point. Life in style is also life in balance. Make sure you pay attention to all the values and dimensions of your life. One is family. If you have someone you care about, there is no value to match that. One person caring for another is life in the best of style and value. Protect it with a vengeance. If a chair gets in the way, I suggest you destroy the chair. It was wisely said so long ago, but is still true for today. There are many treasures, but the greatest of these is love. Better to live in a tent on the beach and have a love affair than to live in a mansion by yourself. Ask me. I know. Family must be cultivated like an enterprise, like a garden. Time and effort and imagination, creativity and genius must be summoned constantly to keep it flourishing and growing. Next is friendship. A priceless value, friendship. Friends are those incredible people who know all about you and still like you. Friends are those people who are coming in when everyone else is leaving. And as someone once suggested, be sure to make the kind of friends on your way up who will take you in on your way down. Life is a bit of both up and down, but with true friends, friends who care regardless of your circumstances, the ups are more automatic and the downs less devastating. I do have one very special friend though. If I was stuck in a Mexican jail and accused unduly, I would call this friend. Guess why I'd call this friend? He would come and get me. Now that is a friend. Someone who would come and get you. Guess how much you would spend to get me? Right, as much as it would take. Guess how long he would try to get me out? You're right, as long as it would take. That is a friend, someone who would come and get you. Now I also have some casual friends who would probably say, call me when you get back. I guess we all have some of those friends. But friendship is so vitally important to those in search of the good life. Make sure your friendships get the attention and the effort they deserve. Properly nourished, they will give back to you that priceless treasure of both pleasure and satisfaction called the good life. And remember, the good life is not an amount. The good life is an attitude, an act, an idea, a discovery, a search. The good life comes from lifestyle that is fully developed, regardless of your bank account, so that it provides you with a constant sense of joy in living and fuels the fires of commitment to all of the disciplines and fundamentals that make life worthwhile. The first thing you start changing is what? Your philosophy. You start changing your mind. You start changing how you think. You start picking up new ideas and information gather new knowledge, make better decisions about what's valuable. And I'm telling you, if you'll do that, your whole life will change. Your health will change. Your relationship with your family will change. Your ability to cope with challenges and problems will change. I'm telling you, income, promotions, all of it will change. If you will change, it'll all change. If you won't change, it isn't going to change. You can keep your fingers crossed if you want to and hope they'll straighten it out. You can wish for the wind not to blow quite as severe, but I'm telling you, wishing for the wind to change in your favor, we call naive at best. Don't do this any longer. Wish for a better wind. The key is to wish for the wisdom to set a better sail. Utilize whatever wind that blows to take you wherever you want to go. That is the philosophy I picked up at age 25 and it revolutionized my whole life. And here's what I found. I found it was easy. I got rich by the time I was 31 and it was easy. Now here's my definition of easy. Got to jot this down. My definition of easy, meaning something I could do. I figure if it's something you can do, it's easy. Now here's a parenthesis, parenthesis, I worked hard at it. I found something I could do, which was easy, but I worked hard at it. I got up early and stayed up late, worked hard that six years. But what I did was easy, meaning it was something I could do. 
You say, well, Mr. Ron, if it was so easy, how come everybody else around you during that six years, how come they didn't get rich? Here's why. It's easy not to. How else would you describe it? That's it. You say, no, no. For all of the rest of them, it was hard for them and it was easy for you. That's not true. You couldn't debate me on that in front of this intelligent audience. But here's the challenge. Let me give it to you in a philosophical phrase. I tend to be a little philosophical. Here it is. The things that are easy to do are also easy not to do. That's the difference between success and failure. I did not neglect to do the easy things I could do every day for six years. Underline, I did not neglect. That's the key. I found something easy I could do that led to fortune and I did not neglect to do it. And here's the problem with neglect. It starts as an infection. And if you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. And here's what else is the problem. One neglect leads to another. Neglect to do wise things with your money, you'll probably neglect to do wise things with your time. Neglect to do wise things with your time, you'll probably neglect to do wise things with your business. One leads to another leads to another. Pretty soon, neglect has you by the throat, emptying your purse, emptying your heart, emptying all of your chances for equities and power and all the good things. What if you should be walking around the block every day for your good health and you don't? I'm telling you, you're on the wrong track. You should do it, you could do it, you don't do it. That's called formula for disaster. All you've got to do is let that and a few other things accumulate for six years, and now you're driving what you don't want to drive, wearing what you don't want to wear, living where you don't want to live, doing what you don't want to do, maybe having become what you really didn't want to become. I'm telling you, that's it. Just neglect along, drift along, and it's got you by the throat. It'll take all your values, leave you with just a little bit of dust in a summer wind, and it'll soon be gone. That's it. It's where I found myself at age 25 until my teacher came along and said, Mr. Owen, up till now you've messed up. Let's see if we can't clean that up, change it all. I did change my life, not just the money, all the rest of the values that came pouring in when I understood that it was me. It was me. We intend to when the idea strikes us. We intend to when the emotion is high. But now if you don't translate that into action fairly soon, now the intent starts to diminish, diminish, diminish. And a month from now, it's cold. A year from now, can't be found. So act, set up a discipline when the emotions are high and the idea is strong and clear and powerful. That's the time to set up the discipline. Somebody talks about good health and you're stirred. Right, you need to get a book on nutrition. Get the book before the idea passes and before the emotion gets cold. Go for the book, start the library, start the process, fall on the floor, do some pushing. Action. Got to take action. Now, here's what's important about discipline. All disciplines affect each other. In fact, here's a good philosophical phrase. Everything affects everything else. Nothing stands alone. Don't be naive in saying, well, this doesn't matter. I'm telling you, everything matters. There are some things that matter more than others, but there isn't anything that doesn't matter. That's why action is so important. The least action, the smallest action. Take it. Because when you start accomplishing and the value starts to return from that one action, it'll inspire you to do the next one and the next one and the next one. You start walking around the block, it'll inspire you to get an apple. Get an apple, it'll inspire you to get a book. Get a book, it'll inspire you to get a journal. Get a journal, it'll inspire you to grow, develop some skills. All disciplines affect each other. Every lack affects the rest. Every new affects the rest. The key is to diminish the lack and set up the new. And you've started a whole new life process. Also, one more thought on discipline. Here's the greatest value of discipline. Self-worth. Self-esteem. People are teaching self-esteem these days, but they don't connect it to discipline. The least lack of discipline, and it starts to erode our psyche. One of the greatest temptations is to just ease up a little bit. The slightest lack of doing your best starts to erode the psyche. Instead of doing your best, doing just a little less than your best. Sure enough. You say, well, it's just going to affect my sales. No, it's going to affect your consciousness. It's going to affect your philosophy. Now you've begun in the slightest way to affect your own philosophy. I got better day by day and week by week and month by month. And I'm asking you to do the same thing until you can develop a long arm and a long reach. Until you can develop influence that won't quit. Touch people next year you couldn't touch this year. Touch people now you couldn't touch before. Conduct a meeting now you couldn't conduct before. Heart and soul now mixed in there that wasn't there, missing before. I'm asking all of you to get better in spite of the winters, in spite of the downturn. 
the money downturn, the social downturn, the personal downturn, whatever it is, just get stronger.